डॉक्टर अदिति के साथ में थे you can start dr aditi yes ma'am so a very good evening to one and all i would like to welcome you to the second online monthly meet of sfm telangana so uh, before we start today's proceedings uh, just quick recap regarding the uh, previous ses session this was held on 16th of march where we had discussed about the fetal heart and the genetics related to it the session was well appreciated and we are hoping the same for this time so uh, i would like to first invite dr chinmay president sfm telangana to start with the welcome address thank you aditi uh, a very good evening to all of you present here i would uh, acknowledge the presence of our uh, founder president uh, dr ashok karana our mentor forever and uh, somebody who inspires us with all his vision tlen pravin our uh, past president of the sfm uh dr bimal sahani the president of sfm and uh, geeta ma'am our senior advisor uh, for the sfm telangana at the outset sir thank you very much for having a separate chapter for telangana and the very purpose of having this chapter was to give an outlet to a lot of people who've been working in areas that have not received as much exposure as those that are in the frontline cities so we are very happy today that we have a participant from warangal dr madhavi lata who's been uh, there from uh, working there for many years and has been uh, contributing to the uh, healthcare system in the uh, uh, city of warangal and today she will be presenting one of her cases uh, in this forum for discussion we uh, welcome dr adi narayan makam who's uh, from bangalore and a real real maverick in the science of fetal medicine and when it comes to heterotaxy very few people understand heterotaxy as well as it does because you know he understands everything that's out of place so <laughs> and we are very happy to have him here and i can see dr sunil jaiman also online and he is a uh, fetal pathologist par excellence and he's all around the globe so i don't know where he's trotting right now but very very warm welcome to you sunil sir and with this i think we'll get on started we have dr aditi as the master of ceremony taking us through the uh, presentations and we have a few case presentations followed by an expert panel discussion with all the luminary stalwarts that we have here so over to you aditi Dr. Aditi, will you please introduce the first uh, speaker? I think we are having some connectivity issues, so let me just uh, invite on stage Dr. Adi Narayan Makam and Dr. Geeta Kolar, who will be the chairpersons for the first session. Dr. Adi Narayan Makam is the director of Adi Hospital Care in Bangalore, and he's a very, very well-known name in fetal yes. medicine in India. he doesn't believe in 1d or 2d he directly goes to 3d for everything and the way he does 3d is par excellence his pictures are beautiful and he says understanding the unborn you know u t u that is his um, sort of catch catch line am i right uh, dr adi yes, yes, welcome yes. to our meeting thank you and, uh, thank Gita you very much <laughs> geeta ma'am is again somebody all of us know So this is the illustrious CV of Dr. Adi Narayan Makam. He's had a uh, training in the United Kingdom for over ten years, and had been a lead consultant in fetal medicine at the Royal Gwent Hospital from 2010 to 12. And thereafter, we are lucky that he came back to India and taught us how to understand the unborn. He's a very, very passionate teacher. a wonderful human being with many facets to his personality so we will uh, learn how much he understands heterotaxy in the course of the evening dr geeta kolar is the other expert and uh, i am in no position to introduce her to this gathering because she is the one who introduced me to uh, ultrasound way back in 2004 when i used to watch her doing scans in fernandes hospital madam is really a great academician and a very very good teacher so we have two very luminary experts for this session and aditi uh, you please call on the first speaker and we'll start it unmute yourself please 
Our first speaker for tonight is Dr. Madhvi Lata. So, Dr. Madhvi has had 22 years of uh, experience in fetal imaging and in the radiology department in Varangal Medical College. She is also the managing director of Vinuta Scan Center and has had uh, several publications in reputed journals of rare cases. She has also recently presented fetal venous abnormalities in the fetal cardiocon in 2019 Delhi and in the 30th World Congress at ISUA 2020. So with this, I would like to invite Dr. Madhvi. Uh, Ma'am, can you please continue? Dr. Madhvi Leta will be presenting a case on situs inverses. You can share your screen, Dr. Madhavi. You can make it full screen and then it's all yours. So good evening all. Thanks, Dr. Aditi. And uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to the SFM Telangana chapter. So today, the first I'm going to start with the sequential segmental analysis of a complex cardiac abnormality. So the basic approach for sequential segmental analysis are the initially you have to assess the fetal right and left orientation and the visceral abdominal and situs. Uh, then look for the veno-atrial relationship and atrial morphology, atrioventricular relationship and ventricular morphology and look for the ventriculo arterial relationship and great arterial relationship. All these are the basic steps for the fetal echo. And uh, for the orientation of the fetal situs, uh, it depends on the fetal eye and the position of the fetus, uh, fetus to the maternal eye. So for first, you need to take an axial sweep from the abdomen to the thorax, look for the stomach and the apex of the cardia, whether they both are on the same side. That means these structures, they are in the left side. It is not that they are in the left side, but they are in the same. You know that they are on the same side. If it is not there, then that is the visorocardiac heterotaxy. Then look for the orientation of right and left sidedness of the fetus. For that, you need to take the axial uh, section of the abdomen look for the descending iota and draw a circle communicating the descending connecting the descending iota stomach umbilical vein and the liver if the circle is going in clockwise direction then the fetus has to be in the cephalic presentation if it is not if it is going on anti clockwise then the fetus has to be in the podalic presentation if it is not following this then that is the uh, and then that is uh, the abdominal situs is situs inverses. Here, this is the case of 21 to 22 weeks fetus showing cardia and uh, cardiac apex and the stomach in the opposite direction. So the, it is basically it is a misericardiac heterotaxy. If you go in detail, so in this section, uh, if you draw a uh, connection um, from the descending iota, stomach, umbilical vein and liver, the circle is going in anti-clockwise direction, whereas the fetus is in cephalic presentation. So the situs is here, situs inverses position. Whereas um, regarding the heart, if you see the anterior chamber, this the apex is on towards the left side. But uh, in detail, if you go by morphological uh, morphology of the chambers, the right sided that is anteriorly placed uh, ventricle is showing the forming the apex and the av valve is basally placed so this is morphological left ventricle which is placed on right side here on the left sided uh, ventricle showing moderator band and the uh, av valves at the apical position so this is morphological right ventricle so regarding the atrial uh, veno atrial connections this is important for situs, where you can see the pulmonary veins are draining into anteriorly placed right atrium, right-sided atrium. And if you see the atrial appendix, the atrial appendix is finger-like here. But normally, right-sided uh, atrium, uh, atrial appendix should be broad-based, whereas here it is finger-like. So this is morphological left atrium presented on right side. If you see the 
left sided atrial appendage showing broad base so this is morphological right atrium presented on the left side so here uh, if you see in this clip you can see uh, uh, trace the ibc from the abdomen into the thorax uh, into the heart the ibc is drained to the left sided atrium so also you can see the ibc and sbc draining into the left sided atrium so this is the five chamber view you can see the small uh, calibered uh, aorta small calibered aorta and uh, here in this you can see the large calibered the pulmonary artery arising from the morphological right ventricle that is presented on left side so the ductal arch is prominent and it is it is on right side even the descending aorta is on right side so right aortic arch so this is the three vessel view showing the uh, main pulmonary artery aorta and svc the caliber of aorta ascending aorta is almost equal to the svc so it is very much narrowed here in this uh, clip you can see the here uh, the aortic arch is missing and the aorta ascending small caliber small ascending aorta is going uh, going uh, straight into the neck so th there is a high possibility of interrupted aortic arch this is the four district acquisition showing there is a vsd uh, with uh, aorta is uh, more committed to the left sided ventricle that means the morphological right ventricle and the um, uh, pulmonary artery is arising from the morphological right ventricle so it is devor we and these are the autopsy findings which country artery aorta and svc and uh, here the there is the stomach is on right side and apex of the cardia is on left side and um, you can see the aortic arch here it is giving rise to the branches and uh, in this also you can see this is the ductal arch and this is the aortic arch after giving the three branches aortic arch is connected to the uh, ductal arch so there is a aortic arch but it is very much narrow suggestive of severe coarctation of aorta so in this case you know we have seen that uh, aorta and stomach on left side ivc and liver sorry aorta and stomach on right side ivc and liver on left side here gv is not visualized and uh, regarding the heart right cardiac chambers on left side and left cardiac chambers on uh, right side so the cardiac apex is on left side there is devorv with severe coarctation so finally this is the case of situs inversus totalis with levo rotation of the cardia showing devorv with severe coarctation of aorta these are the some more cases regarding the situs inversus uh, totalis so this is the case uh, of 20 21 weeks fetus showing situs inversus totalis uh, with um, stomach aorta and gb on right side ivc and liver on left side uh, with right cardiac structures on left side and left cardiac structures on right side suggest of situs inversus totalis regarding the cardiac uh, intracardiac abnormalities there is unbalanced avsd both great vessels arising from morphological right ventricle with small pulmonary artery and absent ductus here you can see the ductus is absent so uh, and uh, there is thymus uh, thymus not visualized you can see aorta is uh, there is no gap between the aorta and the anterior abdomen uh, anterior thoracic wall so thymus is not visualized these are some more cases um, uh, it is around 23 weeks uh, fetus showing situs inversus totalis the the intracardiac morphology is normal but there is a cleft lip and palate and this is one more case uh, of 21 weeks fetus uh, showing situs inversus totalis with double svc
So regarding the situs inversus totalis, it is the mirror image of situs solitus. The incidence varies from 1 in 2500 to 1 in 20,000. Here, the association with congenital heart diseases are uh, very much high. It is around 0.3 to 5 percent. 20 percent of the situs inversus totalis are associated with Cartagena syndrome, which is an autosomal residue condition. It is a uh, subtype of uh, ciliopathy. Here, the here they are, they will have the repeated recurrent uh, respiratory infections and uh, subfertility. So, uh, and uh, the situs inversus totalis, the commonly associated congenital heart disease with that is TOF and uh, VSD and DORV, etc. It is also associated with maternal diabetes mellitus and consanguinity. Not only that, we should know the previous history of situs inversus totalis and also screen the parents for situs abnormality. So my conclusion, these are the main steps unraveling the multiple components of the major cardiac anomaly, mainly involving the situs. Situs inversus totalis without structural or congenital heart disease can be missed in so many times. So always look for uh, situs carefully and follow the basic steps. Thank you. Thank you for all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhavi, for the uh, different number of cases and the uh, extensive detailed evaluation that was done. Uh, we have a few minutes for uh, discussion right now. If there are any questions or anything. Dr. Adi, can you uh, take on the discussion? Yeah. Um, Dr. Madhavi, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, nice images, uh, nice 3D. More than that, uh, the autopsy images are wonderful. Uh, very impressive. Uh, my first question is your first case, is it a heterotaxy or a situs, uh, sorry, uh, situs inversus totalis? Sir, situs inversus totalis with levo rotation of the heart, sir. Uh, no, I mean, as much as I understood, situs inversus totalis means it's a complete mirror image. So, heart should be on the right side, not on the left side. Yes, sir, it is, uh, but the, there is a levo rotation along with the situs inverses, sir. Because yeah. the situs... This is, uh, you know, if you look at situs alone, this is ambiguous situs. So, abdominal situs is on the right side, the thoracic situs is the left side. What about the lungs? Uh, did you have oil of lungs on both sides or... Uh, no, sir, both are um, uh, morphological uh, right-sided uh, right lung is on left side and left is on right side, sir. So it is situs inversus totalis, sir. Only the cardiac axis is rotated. That's all, sir. I know it's a complex one, uh, yeah. but uh, to call it as a situs uh, inversus right totalis, all right. of them should be reversed. The right atrium is on left side, and left atrium is on right side. Basically, situs is uh, more uh, favorable with atrial connections, sir. Is okay. it? Uh, I mean, uh, the, there is a lot of uh, confusion in the literature regarding what do we name, how do we name them. Uh, yes, from the definition perspective, situs inverse totalis is complete reversal of the normal situs solitus. And if there is any change, it is heterotaxy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, if you in your autopsy specimen, if the lungs uh, are also reversed, it's yes, a complex uh, situs. Reversed, sir. Yeah, it's a complex situs uh, problem. Uh, it, it will be difficult to name exactly what it is. So, okay. I would rather go in favor of uh, heterodaxy rather than status total as other people, other experts think. Uh, I, would, I would go as heterodaxy. Okay. I think basically it is a situs ambiguous. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I mean, because uh, if it is a situs solitus, it, the apex of the stomach are on the same side. Whereas uh, uh, if it inverses, it is on the opposite side. That is almost the mirror image that is flipping. Yeah. Whereas uh, whenever you have opposite, that is the stomach on one side and the heart apex on the other side, you call it as a scientist ambiguous. I think right. basically this is what we need to understand before we go further into the cardiac abnormalities. Because unless we understand this, then the few, I mean, the progress will be easy. Yeah, so, I think we can go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for yeah. the experts because I think that message was quite clear that 
we should not label it as one entity unless everything falls into the definition of that entity. So instead of calling this as a situs inversus totalis, it would be good to just call it as part of a heterotaxy with some ambiguity in the situs. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next case, Aditi. So our next speaker for tonight is Dr. Sudha. Dr. Sudha is a consultant at Resolution Fetal Medicine Center. So handing over to you, Dr. Sudha. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Vidya Sudha from the team Resolution Fetal Medicine Center and Research Institute, Hyderabad. I'll be sharing my slides. So I'm here to present a rare a present a rare case findings, uh, in, which is enough uh, from our unit. Sorry, ma'am. Share your screen. There's the green share button down there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you see my slides, ma'am? They're just coming on. Your uh, screen sharing is paused. Uh, that's the message I'm getting, ma'am. No, you, you, have you opened your uh, presentation? You open your presentation and then share the screen. Um, please share again. Make it full screen, huh? Start. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm here to present a rate case from, from our unit. And Mrs. X, she's 21 year old, primary gravida, not married within the consanguinity, and referred to us at 23 weeks. Um, she spontaneously conceived, an anti scan was done at other center, which is reported normal, and she did not do any biochemical screening for fetal chromosomal aneuploidies. So, before starting a stepwise analysis of the fetal scan findings, I want to tell you about the fetal orientation. One second, ma'am. I want you. Uh, I want you. I want all of you to know about the fetal orientation on the day of the scan. The fetus in cephalic presentation with supine position and spine facing down. According to the right hand thumb rule, where the palm of the hand will be uh, will be representing the fetal face, and the thumb will always represent in the fetal left side. So when the fetus in cephalic presentation and supine position, spine facing down, this will be the image. So this will, uh, the cursor is showing the left side. So the, the apex of the heart in the axial section of the thorax in the pical four chamber view, the heart is facing towards the left side, but the stomach is there on the opposite side. This is a dextrogastria. So uh, we, could, we could also see a heart with a left, left axis deviation. So uh, this is a, a quick overview of the same thing which, have, which I have explained in the previous slide. So uh, when you follow my cursor, so this is the right hand thumb rule. So when the feet is in cephalic position and supine and back down, the thumb will always represent the fetal left side. So you can see the stomach in the left side and the apex of the heart in the left side. This is a normal thing. Next, uh, the no normal cardiac axis, usually uh, it will be 45 degrees plus or minus 20 degrees to the left side. But in this case, we can see an exaggerated left axis deviation. And adding to the cardiac findings, we could also see an AVSD. You can see here, sorry, uh, VSD. Uh, and also in this video, uh, we could see a persistent fetal bradycardia, which might be due to the heart rhythm abnormalities. So, which is an important finding in uh, left isomerism of heterotaxis syndrome. So, these are the cardiac findings and also the, um, the stomach, the, the dextrogastria. Next, uh, we could also see an interrupted IVC with azygous, interrupted IC, IVC with an azygous vein. And in this axial section of the fetal upper abdomen, we can see here two vessels. This is a double vessel sign. I will describe it. So, a double vessel sign is that azygous vein located by along the fetal spine posterior to the descending iota. So this is known as a double vessel sign and we can see it here. So this is seen an interrupted IVC with azygous vein, which is also seen in left isomerism. So this is a schematic diagram uh, diagrammatic representation of the azygous vein, where we can see the interruption of the IVC and the azygous vein here. 
Next, uh, in the fetal abdomen, we couldn't see a gallbladder, and this might be due to the uh, evolving uh, biliary atresia that might be um, like diagnosed postnatally, definitely. And also, we could see prominent bubble loops that might be due to the bubble malrotation. So I'll give you a quick uh, overview of all the defin basic definitions. Situs is defined as arrangement of the viscera, atria, and vessels within the body. The situs saltus is that normal arrangement that left side organs are present on the left side and the right side organs are present on the right side. In case of situs inversus, that is inverted arrangement, mirror image arrangement, that is the left side organs are present on the right and right side on the left. So situs ambiguous is that one, which is not either situs saltus or either fit into situs inversus. So, but, but there are some uh, disturbances in the arrangements along the left and right axis. So as I said, neither be a situs solitus or situs inversus. So they are divided into two types, left isomerism or polysplenia, polysplenia and right isomerism or esplenia. So to label it as left isomerism, we should, do, we should see at least two ultrasound findings out of these three. So uh, this is like situs ambiguous, discordant laterality of the stomach, the dextrogastria, or portal sinus, or of the gallbladder, and azygous continuation of the interrupted inferior vena cavae and heart block. So either two of these three must be present. Uh, in, in case of right isomerism, either uh, two of these three um, findings must be present. Cardiac defects, situs ambiguous, the abdominal situs, and a juxtaposition of inferior vena cava and aorta on the same side of the spine. In right isomerism, we could see it on the right side. The two vessels will be seen on the same side, the IV, uh, the IVC and the aorta. So this is according to this paper. So uh, concluding uh, about our case, so we could see all these findings, the azygous vein, double vessel sign, left axis deviation, VSD, cardiac rhythm abnormalities, um, I wanted to point it out, and dextrogastria, suspected biliary atresia, and intestinal malrotation. So putting it together, so we diagnosed it as mostly a heterotaxis syndrome with left-sided isomerism. Explain the findings uh, and, um, and also the outcome, like the prognosis to the couple and the rare possibility of genetic and chromosomal association. But uh, they, uh, they opted to terminate the pregnancy and we have given the option of the adopsy, but the couple denied that option. So uh, a quick thing, uh, so after diagnosing a hetero uh, taxi syndrome, uh, we need to label it in this manner. So stepwise and logical progression of analysis. So first we have to uh, label the position of the heart in the chest, orientation of the cardiac apex, venoatrial connections, relationship and arrangement of the remaining thoracic abdominal organs, including the spleen, lungs and intestines. So we should also put a note on the spleen morphology. So um, after a quick uh, literature search, so I could find uh, the incidences of uh, these uh, findings. So gut malnutrition and biliary atresia are the most common things, which are seen in 40 to 50% of the cases. But in 60% of the prenatal cases, we could see cardiac rhythm abnormalities and left isomerism, which is seen in our case. So usually in left isomerism, early fetal heart block and high drops may be associated as the cardiac looping and asymmetrical gut morphogenesis are the first events in the embryo which involve the left-right asymmetry. So uh, regarding the counseling, the severity of the cardiac malformation is the main determinant of the outcome. And about the prognosis, we should be uh, counseling to the couple. And the presence of the extra cardiac malformation is associated with the increased morbidity and mortality, which might be associated with the repeated surgeries postnatally. These all things must be counseled to the uh, patients before just uh, they are continuing and they must be knowing about all these things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. Your comments, Dr. Adi. Yeah, beautifully presented. Uh, nice images. Uh, Sudha, what was uh, the diagnostic features to say it's a left atrial isomerism? Uh, sir, we could uh, see a uh, bradycardia and dextrogastria and also azygous swim. So um, we uh, probably diagnosed it as a heterotaxy syndrome, left isomerism. Okay, can you open uh, your first uh, uh, slide? Okay, sir. Share your screen again, Sudha. Okay, sir. Ah, that one, first one. This one, ah, sir. Third one, third one. This one before. This one. Third, third slide, yeah, that one. 
So in this one image, can you diagnose this as a left isomerism? Yes. So we could see a, a dextrogastria. Yeah. And also uh, two vessels. Actually, we could see, sir. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, we could see an VST. So yeah, yeah. forget about that. Uh, can you see the stomach and heart on either side of the baby? Yes, sir. And uh, can you see the area behind the heart? Yes, double, sir. Double vessel. Double, double vessel. vessel. Yes, sir. Yes. So that is only one is iota, another is azygous. Azygous. Azygous normally present, but will not be easily seen unless it is dilated. Mm -hmm. So azygous will be present when there is no IVC continuation. Uh, interruption of IVC. Yeah. So IVC is a, an, a, is a right sided structure. Mm -hmm. If the baby doesn't understand what is right, it doubles the left sided structure. So that's why it's called left heterotaxy. Mm -hmm. So in that one image, you could make a diagnosis of all uh, left atrial isomerism. What are the criteria? One is your site as ambiguous. Yes. Sir. Another? As I guess we... Interrupted IVC. Mm -hmm. And the third one? ABS. Yes. Hard, hard block. Yes. Hard block again because the conducting system will be majority down. belongs to right side. Baby okay. has not understood what is right. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is done more of left. Mm -hmm. okay. So you, do, you don't need to have all the three, you, don't, you need only two. Okay. So in this one image, you can make left atrial isomerism as a diagnosis. Okay. Less than two seconds. Okay. Sir. Good. Okay. My another question quickly why do you get the juxtaposition of the IVC in right atrial isomerism? Okay, <laughs> maybe because uh, the liver is uh, central in position. So that, that has pushed the IVC uh, towards the left side rather than being on the right side because the liver occupies the central position of the abdomen. Okay, good. Sorry. Uh, nice, nice presentation. I love it. Thank you, sir. Good. Chinmay, you may want to ask. No, no. Thank you so much. And uh, see, those are the expert inputs which we'll get only from you, isn't it? We didn't think of the liver pushing the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the vessel down there, the vein into the midline. So, uh, uh, can you move on to the next speaker, Aditi? Yes. So, uh, our next speaker for today is Dr. Aditya Kulkarni. Dr. Aditya Kulkarni is a pathologist. He is a associate. Uh, he is an associate consultant working in the uh, Department of Histopathology at the uh, Apollo Health Sciences. And uh, the in his areas of interest are perinatal pathology, gynec pathology, as well as artificial intelligence and computational pathology. So, uh, Dr. Aditya, we are waiting to hear your session. Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, so I thought today, uh, is my screen visible? And uh, Yes, hope, we can see you, just yeah. make it full screen. Yeah, and I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I thought today, uh, in context of these two previous cases, we could discuss the fetal pathology perspective of cytal abno cytus abnormalities. It's more of a theoretical talk, uh, just highlighting points that we as fetal pathologists look for. And uh, there might be some overlap. Let me just uh, tell you that at the outset because of uh, with the previous cases, uh, I will try to run through those. Okay. So we were, we'll discuss definitions and uh, terminologies and classification of cytus abnormalities, which is admittedly again has already been discussed. We'll talk about cytos abnormalities as, as a whole, and then we'll discuss the approach uh, to cytos anomalies on fetal autopsy. Um, coming to the definitions, cytos solitus, as has been told before, is the normal arrangement, and it, uh, it does not mean just the cardiac or the, just the thoracic cavity arrangement. It also means the abdominal cytos. So you should have uh, levocardia and uh, morphologically right atrium on the right side, morphologically left atrium on the left side, 
and right lung on the right side and so on. Uh, so also you should have uh, a left-sided spleen, a left-handed stomach and a liver on the right side. Situs inversus is exact mirror image of that. Uh, the heart shows dextrocardia. And one important point to note here is that the uh, heart, uh, heart situs, the heart uh, location in the left hemithorax or right hemithorax does not uh, really entail, does not really mean uh, abnormality of the uh, connections, internal morphology and connections of the heart. It just means that the location is different. That we will still need to see uh, uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. Anything in between is situs ambiguous. Uh, basically where we can't classify it either way, we call it situs ambiguous, also known as heterotaxy syndromes, also known as cardio cardiosplenic syndromes. And uh, left isomerism and right isomerism are the subtypes as has been told before. So just to uh, quickly recap the situs solitus. So you get a morphologically right atrium with a right atrial appendage, which, is, which has its own characteristic feature. Uh, on the right side, you get a trilobed lung on the right side, and you get the apex of the cardia, uh, apex of the heart on in the left side at an axis, at an angle of around 45 degrees to the vertebral column, and you get a bilobed lung on the uh, left side. Internal morphology, this is a, a picture, diagrammatic representation of the internal morphology of the atria, which is where you identify the situs abnormalities. So the right atria will show pectinate muscles with a uh, pectinate line here, and the left atria will be much smoother and it will have a very narrow atrial appendage with pectinate muscle detrabeculations de confined to the appendage. And this is what it looks like. This is one of our cases. This is what it looks like uh, on autopsy. So you open the trunk and then you see a dextrocardia, you see a trilobed lung, as you can see here. And uh, the relation of the arteries is normal. The branches are normal. And you can see the atrial morphology quite clearly here. The right atrial appendage will be uh, trapezoidal and more broad and the left atrial appendage will be narrow and finger-like. By contrast, the situs inversus is a, as we said, a mirror image. So you will get uh, levocardia, sorry, dextrocardia, I'm so sorry, dextrocardia, and uh, as can be seen here, and the atrial morphology is also reversed. You get a right-sided spleen and you get a right-handed stomach. And this is the diagrammatic figure, representation of the atrial morphology. It is reverse of what was seen before. Uh, bronchial morphology is very, very critical for a diagnosis of a situs abnormality, uh, especially the heterotaxy syndromes. The left atrial, uh, left bronchus is generally uh, more angular, angulated, and uh, it's a steep branch and it's hypoatrial, hypoatrial. That means that it is going underneath the pulmonary artery. The right, at, uh, right bronchus goes alongside the pulmonary arteries and is called uh, apatrial. Uh, by contrast, heterotaxy syndromes, as uh, we have discussed before, can be classified into right isomerism and left isomerism, and you get duplication of either side of the uh, structure. So you get both right, both apartrial bronchi, uh, both trilobed lungs, and you get a transverse liver, and you get um, atrial morphology showing both right-sided atri uh, atria. And by contrast, you see left isomerism and uh, bilateral left atria. And just to show this is a case, now if you compare this with the diag diagrammatic representation, this looks like more of a steep angular branching and uh, both bilobed lungs. So this is a left isomerism. Uh, just a table to highlight the differences between the two. And uh, right atrial isomerism is generally associated with asplenia, whereas left atrial atrial isomerism is generally associated with polysplenia. You get multiple spleens along the greater curvature and uh, you get duplications of uh, lungs and bronchi as stated before. As far as overview of situs abnormalities as a whole is concerned, this is again has been discussed. Uh, our importance for us, the importance of situs abnormalities is with the fact that once you see those, you need to look for other abnormalities. You need to, because these are associated more with uh, congenital heart defects. So you need to look for congenital heart defects and you need to look for uh, more systemic anomalies. 
uh, we don't really know the uh, exact embryogenic uh, embryologic etiopathogenesis however it is whatever happens happens quite early in the pregnancy at around 28 20 to 30 days of gestational age uh, most of these cases are non syndromic and isolated however some of them do show uh, inheritance patterns and most some of them are associated with carter jenner syndrome and primary ciliary dyskinesias uh, i want to highlight the uh, heterotaxy gene that has been described. Uh, it's on long arm of chromosome X and it's responsible for around 75% of X-linked heterotaxy syndromes and around 5% even of uh, isolated heterotaxy syndromes. Other genes dealing with the laterality are also identified and most likely are you know, implicated in these uh, conditions. So I thought I will take this opportunity to discuss uh, fetal autopsy in general a little bit and uh, to discuss what we as pathologists need from the clinicians uh, when we do fetal autopsy. So what we basically need is a detailed in the requisition form with attached all the investigations that have been done, all the relevant investigations that have been done. Uh, we need to take a written and informed consent, uh, uh, you know, uh, before doing the autopsy. More generally, we take the consent of the father and uh, if possible, uh, prior intimation uh, that a new case might be coming is always great. We accept cases between 11 weeks of gestational age and seven days of neonatal life. 11 weeks of gestational age because the organogenesis is not really complete before that. And seven days of neonatal life because beyond that, uh, causes of perinatal causes of fetal mortality are, are uh, really remote. Uh, we need our samples to be submitted in large containers uh, with adequate formalin so that the fetus does not get distorted. And this is our uh, requisition form that we have developed. Uh, we have a pedigree a space for a pedigree chart and family history here. And this is the consent form. And this is typically uh, how a fetus comes to us with a big braid box container, we call them, and uh, adequate amount of formalin. Okay, uh, let us discuss the uh, approach to cytos anomalies. Uh, so, like like has been it has been said before, it's not just the thoracic cytos; it's also abdominal cytos. And what we do is uh, we go in a systematic way. We first uh, examine the thoracic cavity, and then we go to the abdominal cavity. Uh, we open the trunk in an inverted Y incision. Now, this is uh, generally you know it varies from center to center. Uh, in the waist, they generally open in a Y-shaped incision because uh, most of the times the babies are returned to the parents. Uh, we prefer a inverted Y-shaped incision. And uh, once the cardiac, once the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity are open, we go to the examination. And uh, thoracic status, we look for cardiac apex. This, the location of the cardiac apex, is it left-sided or is it right-sided? Uh, we look for thymus if it is there. And we look for the lungs morphology. Is it uh, the right lobe? Is is the right lung three lobe trilobed, and is the left lung bilobed? As you can see here, uh, we can identify the lingula here as well. Uh, then, in general, uh, as a fetal autopsy as a whole, we uh, talk about pleural cavity and the pericardial cavity also. And then we discuss, we examine the lungs in more detail, uh, including the bronchial laterality. The examination of heart takes up bulk of our talk and bulk of our time, really. Uh, so we do a segmental approach with the main segments being atria, ventricles, and the arteries, and the connecting segments being the AV canals and the infundibulum. Uh, we look for position of each, uh, each segment. We look for atrial situs and the features. We will discuss features of those. Uh, we look for ventricular situs and the relationship of great arteries. Uh, in a general in a cardiac examination on the whole we then talk about the relationships of very of all these segments to each other and that that is of value to situs anomalies also but i thought we will limit ourselves to uh, just the laterality part of it this time uh, we look at branches of great vessels and then the internal morphology of the heart chambers so this is just to highlight the segmental approach uh, that we take. We look for the situs and then the cardiac position and segmental analysis and atrial situs and so on. And uh, so this is uh, the right-sided heart, so to speak. 
the right atrium, as you can see, as we have said before, the right atrial appendage is the where you identify the right atrium, morphologically right atrium. Uh, and so that's the key basically, uh, that the morphologically right atrium has to be identified. It need not necessarily be on the right side. And if it is not on the right side, then you start thinking in terms of the situs anomalies. So right atrium, broad based at right atrial appendage and the right at ventricle is uh, kind of trapezoidal in shape with the, sorry, with the tapering side of the trapezoid towards the outflow. By contrast, the left atrial appendage is narrow, conical and uh, finger like almost as you can see here. And it has, you will see uh, the openings of pulmonary veins into a normal left atrium and a, a left ventricle and in this view, it's more or less uh, circular or spherical. Um, so that is how initially we, we identify the uh, atria and ventricles. Then uh, we go in detail in the internal morphology, the right atrial appendage, right atrium will show pectinate muscles and uh, you'll see a fold of septum secundum. You will see coronary sinus opening and then the opening into the uh, tricuspid valve. By contrast, the left atrium will be much more smoother with the pectinate muscles just confined to the atrial appendage and you will see a broad septum primum and then the opening into the bicuspid valve. Uh, right ventricle, we see uh, the pectinate muscles and the coarse trabeculations and then the smooth infundibulum, that is uh, how we identify the right, right ventricle leading into the outlet with semilunar valve. Uh, Laterality of ventricles is also identified by uh, the D loop. So D loop is the normal position, the right sided loop it's called uh, basically uh, if you were to put your hand over the ventricle, the thumb would point towards the inflow and the uh, fingers would point, point towards the outflow. And uh, L loop, if you see an L loop, then that is situs uh, abnormality, as you can see in this picture. Similarly, the left ventricle uh, will be characterized by morphologic left ventricle, that is, will be characterized by fine trabeculations, and you will see uh, a fibrous continuity of uh, mitral and aortic valves. And then again, you will see a D loop, which is again the inflow point, uh, thumb pointing towards, uh, if you put left hand over the ventricle, the thumb pointing towards the inflow and the fingers pointing towards the outflow. So this is how we had diagnosed the laterality. Uh, in a normal condition, in a cytosolitus, uh, the right atrium would be, uh, morphologic right atrium would be in the right uh, side of the heart and so on. The relationships of great arteries also vary, uh, varies according to the situs. In the normally, the, side, the aorta would be superficial and towards the right of the pulmonary trunk and uh, reverse in the situs inverses as, as seen in this, these pictures. So uh, I'm nearing the end of my talk. So uh, like I said, we diagnose, we look at abdominal situs also. So the uh, ileocecal junction should normally be in the right lower quadrant. The liver should be on the right side and the stomach should be left sided. The spleen examination, as was discussed by the previous speakers, is also important. We, you need to not only see the situs of the spleen, but number or presence or absence. And um, we need to look for atresias in these cases because atresias are quite commonly associated with situs anomalies. So this is not a case of situs anomaly, but just to highlight, uh, this was a case of duodenal atresia and even there was quite a lot of malrotation and deviation of the situs, as you can see with the liver here. To summarize, uh, we need detailed clinical history and imaging findings from you. And uh, we promise we do a very thorough fetal examination. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the third point here because like Sir said in the first case, uh, the recent trend, or at least I should say the recent updates, uh, recent train of thought is that uh, rather than giving it a single name, rather than calling it uh, ambiguous or inverses or heterotaxy syndromes, 
uh, we should be probably going in favor of a descriptive diagnosis. So calling it as situs ambiguous and then just enlisting all the findings that are seen because uh, that will give a detailed picture to our uh, medical geneticists and fetal medicine consultants and uh, it will provide you know, inputs for, for the genetic analysis and counseling. These are my references. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aditya, because that is a completely different perspective. When we look at it in imaging, we see different things and the way you approach it postnatally is very different and you have the advantage of looking at all the other um, universal uh, arrangements as well. So with this background, we will now move on to the next part of this program, which is a expert uh, panel discussion and audience interaction for which I would uh, request Dr. Khurana, uh, Geeta Madam, Dr. Praveen and uh, Dr. Adi Narayan Makam to uh, please answer some of our queries of our audience and then give us some insights into this really complex topic because although our uh, presenters have presented these cases in a simplified manner, it is actually a big challenge when it comes to um, handling any case with situs anomalies. So uh, this is a formality of having the um, CV of the uh, experts here, but you know, again, who is going to introduce Dr. Kurana to Society for Fetal Medicine? Dr. Kurana, I would say is a lifelong teacher and an excellent uh, you know, inspiration for anybody who wants to do anything good in life. Uh, thank you, sir, for being with us. Uh, Dr. Praveen, again, somebody whom we look up to every time. Uh, he's one of our legendary uh, ultrasonologists here from Hyderabad and an excellent teacher. All of us look up to him. He has uh, lots of achievements in his life. And I have personally seen him receive lifetime achievement awards. So, sir, welcome very much to this evening. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. Dr. Geeta Kolar is a senior consultant in uh, Fernandez Hospital here in Hyderabad. And again, another very passionate teacher and a very, very strong academician. We've already met Dr. Adi. So um, I will just uh, start with the first few questions which are from the audience. And then Dr. Shagun, uh, please come over because some of these questions will have to be from the genetic perspective as well. So, uh, the first question is, how much is the rule clockwise spine, stomach, and portal vein in cephalic presentation for situs applicable? Me to say? Yes. Dr. Kiran has asked this question. How much is the rule clockwise spine, stomach, and portal vein in cephalic presentation for situs applicable? Um, can I take it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, See, it is applicable, provided you have seen the lie of the fetus properly and you have oriented the probe properly. I think everybody has a habit of rotating the probe, you know, angulating it, dipping it, and then you would orient it differently, then you do not get the situs problem. So the four images that we save are the presentation, then the side of the occiput, then we take an axial section of the abdomen and axial section of the fetal thorax at the level of the forechamber. And that's when, if you have not changed or rotated the probe, then you know, okay, this is a cephalic presentation with the occiput to the left. The fetal heart is on the left. So unless you orient yourself to the right and left of the baby with the lie, nothing is applicable. But if you have oriented yourself to the lie and to the right and left side, I think the... Uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise holds very good. We've never had an occasion to doubt it. Uh, Ma'am, I just want to make one point here because some of us scan with our left hands. And when we do that, even in the correct position, the way we scan with the, with the head of the uh, woman is towards us, the other side, and the, uh, and the machine and the feet of the woman are on the same side. Actually, this works. But if the lady is turned around, if her head is the way where when you do a right-handed scan, then this does not work. It just becomes reversed there. 
Sure. So uh, some in, in the case of patients who work with uh, operators who work with left and right side differently, I think imagining yourself in the baby's position would be an easier sure. method to establish situs. Otherwise, there basically we go by taking into consideration the presentation, lie, as well as the relationship of fetal spine to the maternal spine. I think these are this is one of the ways by which you can easily correlate with the so this is one way we teach people is the handheld doll method, which is actually just imagining yourself in the uh, fetal position. And if you can't imagine, then you hold a doll and try to orient yourself with that. And the other one, of course, is this thumb rule. So, I mean, I just want to take from all the experts here. What would you think would be the best way to establish situs for everybody here? There's nothing like a best way. Everything is good in the sense uh, the thumb. Some people uh, very ardently I mean, practice this uh, hand rule, whereas uh, some prefer to use the uh, expecting yourself in the patient's and uh, the baby's position and trying to as I, as identify the situs. I think it all depends on the convenience of the operator. Dr. Adi, um, if you ask the me, the designated expert. No, no, no. Come on. <laughs> uh, if you ask me, my personal view is none of the rules work for me. I'm a simple obstetrician. I can't remember clockwise, anti-clockwise, breach, especially when I'm stressed with uh, an abnormality. I don't want to use my brain. Uh, my simplest approach is you imagine yourself in the, uh, in the mother's tummy, but that also I may have to do some dancing activity to know where I'm lying. So my approach and I, that's what I teach my fellows also in the first few cases take a doll and keep the doll do the uh, survey and keep the doll in that position after two or three you don't need a doll you can throw that away you have to know where is the fetal parts anyway for any diagnosis so why don't you try in yourself to get a 3d reconstruction in your mind when you're doing a scan that would be an easiest so then no, it, it won't take more than a fraction of a second if you train yourself to know the situs. Easy. Thank you. Uh, I, um, many years ago, I decided to do exactly what Adi does. And um, it's nice to follow him because you can always blame him for anything that goes wrong. The, <laughs> the thing is that, you know, with these dolls, we, uh, we made a few mistakes. And some of these dolls... The, turn around their waists and their waists turns around because everything is fixed onto everything else. So it doesn't work. So I just like to put myself, as he said, into the uh, maternal abdomen. And it really seems to be the only way that works each time. And then your mind gets tuned. If, if you learn how to use it early enough, good enough. If you don't learn how to use it, you learn, it, learn to do it sooner or later anyway. After you made your first two mistakes, you, stup you feel stupid enough to say that, no, I have to handle life correctly. So it's nice to make a few mistakes in the beginning and then say, no, I need a system. The simplest system is really to put yourself into the maternal abdomen and it always works. Thank you. Geeta, ma'am, you were saying something. Yeah, uh, another way is all the machines have these uh, images which you can put on the screen. Uh, you know, you have these indicators, the small doll-like things uh, on your images. You can actually see, like Adi said, sometimes you're too tired, a baby is transverse lie with head up, you have twins. So those are the cases where you don't know what side is where. So there are these uh, emoji kind of things on your machine. You can put these and then you can orient yourself that way or keep a doll next to you. But that those machine uh, emojis work quite a bit. They really are useful. Of course, all of this will become quite rare for the next generation because we have uh, recognition. So automatically, your machine will tell you that the stomach is not on the same side as the cardiac apex. And your machine will tell you that the cardiac apex is pushed rather than turned because there is artificial intelligence. And it's not something really, uh, it's not for tomorrow because we have equipment today which is commercially available at actually a cheaper cost than what some of us use. And it actually identifies the stomach, it identifies the heart, it identifies the vena cava, the aorta, and everything else. And there's pretty much not much else that you can identify. We're now working on trying to do anatomical recognition of the portal sinus with its curve to the right. And 
in fact, uh, that, that's the next bit that's going to be added onto the same machines. And this artificial intelligence is, uh, is not, uh, not something that will happen after a few years. It happened two years ago. And the machine is on sale. Um, it's from a fairly famous vendor. It's called the Swift. And it has all this, which is instant recognition. And the machine will tell you that, look, uh, this is visceral situs and this is uh, cardiac situs. So the new generation has it all worked out for themselves. So that's great, but I think uh, at, at any time, uh, natural intelligence should precede artificial intelligence and we should that's have a method. Of artificial intelligence, there's no doubt. The first rule of artificial intelligence is it requires your supervision and mine. True, sir. So, uh, so for CITES, this is what uh, everybody has to say. And uh, that's something which has to be the first step when you start scanning because orientation is one of the most important points there. Then I think there's a comment by Dr. Hemangini that there was dextrocardia and not dextrogastria. And that's what I thought said Dr. Kiran. I suppose this is to that second case which we presented where there was a left atrial isomerism. Left, uh, isomerism. So, um, no, there was dextrogastria based on the situs uh, assessment as was done earlier. So it was a dextrogastria with a levocardia. Uh, in which category does isolated mesocardia fall? Dr. Adi? No category. It's mesocardia. So it doesn't form, uh, according to you, it is not uh, yeah. a situs issue. It's just an access deviation. Yeah. And uh, uh, Dr. Sumati Natrajan asks how to approach cases with isolated altered cardiac access without any structural problems. So there you are. Um. Ravin sir, would you like to take? No, no, come again, come again. I can get the. Yeah. How how should we approach cases with isolated altered cardiac axis without any structural problems? But then the whenever there is an axis uh, alteration, that is, you mean to say the cardiac axis, whether it is right sided or left sided. Actually, there is a wide range of axis in the you know, forty five degrees plus or minus twenty. So quite often when there is an associated one, then we give importance to this axis deviation, but then isolated without any structural abnormality as far as the heart is concerned or any other extra cardiac abnormalities which could be responsible for axis deviation. If they are not there, I think we, we consider it as a variation. And be mindful of those few problems like you know partial anomalous pulmonary venous connections and Thing, because those things can pop up later on. You may not have seen them antenatally. Uh, so the next question is specifically to you, which I think you've answered there, but for the benefit of all others, how can we identify atrial appendage in sonography? Uh, basically, I think I have answered it, but then anyway, uh, appendages are a little difficult to identify as far as the ultrasound is concerned. Uh, in principle, when we think in terms of a left atrial appendage, it is usually finger-like. Or basically we depend on the left atrial morphology rather than the appendage in order to give us, give us an answer. Usually the left atrium has got what is called as the sickle-shaped appearance. And that is the reason why the appendage becomes finger-like or a finger-like projection. Whereas the, the right atrial morphology is broad and blunt. That is the reason why you have the right atrial appendage being uh, uh, pyramidal shaped. So, so as al on ultrasound, sometimes it is very difficult to identify the left atrial appendage and the right atrial appendage. Whenever there is a problem like that, you need to go into the morphology of the right atrium and the left atrium, which gives you an answer. So I think that's how I approach. Thank you, sir. And uh, there's another question from uh, Dr. Aradhya Bhagat. What is the position of the left ventricle and right ventricle in isolated dextrocardia, which is on which side? Geeta, ma'am. No, isolated dextrocardia is just says that the heart is onto the apex of the heart, right side. That's it. So they, I mean. Unless it is associated with other abnormalities, the importance of identifying the uh, left atrial morphology or the right atrial morphology depends on the morphology that has been identified in that particular case. It cannot be generalized. Uh, Chinmay? 
Yes, sir. Can I add? Um, I mean, as Aditya said earlier, we need to give a descriptive diagnosis rather than a diagnosis. And especially with this dextrocardia, dextro rotation, dextro position, it causes a lot of uh, discomfort for so many of us. So all we have to do is to say that heart is in the center, directed towards left, heart in the center, directed towards right. Rather than saying dextrocardia, dextro rotation, dextro position, I fail. So that's if every one of us fall, at least we describe what, what we've seen. That is more important than the actual terminology itself. Even for heterotaxy also, why do we have to break our head to say it's left and right? 10% of them are indeterminate. And only we, what we need to do for a clinical management, we need to know what are the abnormalities, what are the observed uh, ultrasound abnormalities. That's what we have to depict. That's what I feel. No, that's, I think, a very practical approach. Dr. Kurana, would you like to comment on it? I agree completely. Uh, there are so many different names that are used. And equally importantly, pediatric cardiologists like to use different terminology. And it's no fun trying to be on a different page just because we are somebody and they are somebody. So for the sake of the patient, it's much nicer to actually give a nice detailed description you can use some words in a conclusion somewhere, but the detailed description must be nice and prominent, giving each step exactly as we've learned in the first half of today's talks. Because I think the definitions will uh, uh, apply to only those cases where all the components of the definition are fulfilled, but that seldom happens. And therefore a descriptive diagnosis will always be better because that continuity of understanding will be there. Whoever scans after this first person will know exactly what were the findings that the first person was encountering. So uh, there is another comment by Dr. Prajakta. One of the cases of left heterotaxy has SVT. Please explain. SVT, I assume, is supraventricular tachycardia. I don't think we had a case with supraventricular tachycardia, did we? Yeah. We had bradycardia in complete heart block because there was a block in that case, and that, as uh, Dr. Adi also mentioned, because the conducting system of the heart originates from the right atrium. So when you have a left isomerism, you are likely to have a heart block, which is in the definition of the left isomerism. Then uh, Dr. P. Radhika says, a case of elderly primate, 36 years, with query heterotaxy, query C, congenital heart disease, uh, with an interrupted aortic arch and bradycardia, gives a history of a partner with situs inversus totalis, and partner's grandfather also has situs inversus totalis. As they opted genetic testing, which is the best test to be advised in case of the family history with situs issues. I think I'll bring on Dr. Shashagun here. She's actually... Yeah. yeah. So actually, no, I think uh, maybe uh, like we can take this. Uh, uh, shall I just uh, share my screen? Yeah, uh, you please I? share. She had yeah. a set of questions yeah. to discuss. Please do. Yeah. So let's know because uh, we've discussed the morphology, the ultrasound and the autopsy. Uh, just to answer uh, this question and also other questions pertinent to genetic testing. So I'll just uh, share my screen once. I hope it's visible. I, uh, yes, ah, yeah, now it's visible. Okay, so uh, just to uh, like, I mean, uh, you know, like everybody has said that it's a descriptive diagnosis actually, which basically makes a difference to the patient in terms of prognostication in pregnancy and management after birth. So that's actually the main, uh, we can say the running the, I mean, kind of the basis on which these cases, I mean, the, these cases are managed, but still there is a role of genetics. So traditionally it's believed that, I mean, um, these heterotaxy and uh, um, the other situs inverses and all these situs abnormalities are more sporadic. That's the kind of a little bit of a myth or kind of a traditional concept which is there, but uh, there is a significant contribution of genetics. So, and we need to realize that which case, what test to offer, because it makes a difference to the patient, actually. So this, anyways, we've already had a, I mean, discussion that it's not possible to classify, to name often, and we always have a lot of variability. And uh, despite uh, some of the very well-defined phenotypes, there is a lot of things which fall in between. So for the patient's best interest, it's best to describe. 
so um if th this was actually one of a very large study of some 18000 patients uh, with cardiac defects sorry your slides are not moving so can you just make it full screen and uh, and full screen full screen and move them huh? full screen full screen okay actually it's full screen for me i don't know one second just uh, start sharing uh, again yeah yeah i'll do it again so because we all remember being told that we don't need to do karyotyping if it is yes, uh, yes that's exactly so, yeah why right so is the the no, screen make it full screen, screen. Huh. yeah just a sec i'll make it is this full screen now no. not as yet not as yet some issue not you want yet. me to share it i have your presentation okay sure please do that yeah just uh, you i'll yes, share I'll stop share yeah, so uh, what I was just saying that there was a huge study, in fact, where they studied all the cardiac defects and they tried to see that how common was it for a cardiac, a particular type of cardiac defect to recur in a family. And there, in fact, they found that these situs abnormalities were the ones which, was, which had the highest recurrence risk ratio. So, which means that if you compare people uh, with the family history of a situs abnormality, they are much more likely to have another person in the family with a situs abnormality. And this ratio is as high as 79. And for as compared to VSD, where it was lowest at around 3.4. And then there is also some empirical data, which is there based on recurrence and all, which says that around 5 to 10 percent cases recur. So actually, both these statistics themselves point uh, you know, in the direction that there is a genetic contribution, there is a significant recurrence risk which is existing. So, but why we are missing it is the fact that all these years we were basically focusing on doing a karyotype. So, in fact, a karyotype is one of the least, you know, and karyotypic abnormality is the least common association with heterotaxy or a situs abnormality. So, very rarely you would find a trisomy 13 or 18 with a situs abnormality. Otherwise, the karyotype will be normal. So uh, all these years we were thinking that there is no genetic association because the karyotypes are coming back normal. But then now as we, you know, as with ultrasound technology advancing, we have now genetic technology advancing and we're able to see so many other things. So there have also been reports of DiGeorge being associated with situs abnormality. Again, this is very rare. But then there are various animal models in some human studies. And now there are more than 100 genes which are known to be associated with laterality, in fact. Uh, we'll go to next slide, Shinmay. So the most common, which Dr. Um, Aditya also mentioned in his talk, is the ZIK3 gene. So this was the first gene which was known to be associated with situs abnormality. So in fact, if you see a family, if the fetus is a male, so if the fetus is a male and you are seeing heterotaxy, then think of this gene. And especially if there is a family history and it is looking like an X-linked in inheritance, which means that the fetus is a male and maybe the there is a male sibling with a situs abnormality or it may not be a situs abnormality. It may be just a cardiac defect, so which is not fitting into situs abnormality per se. And, or there could be a maternal uncle. So uh, this is excellent inheritance. Males are getting affected, females are not affected. So in such cases, more than 75% have mutation in this gene. That is the ZIK3 gene. And then there are various other genes. Here, the main thing which uh, is important uh, to kind of differentiate is the situs inverses, uh, the classical situs inverses, where there is no confusion. You have a pure mirror image. So these cases are actually, uh, we know ourselves also that they have a good prognosis, most of them. And we see so many people who are incidentally detected uh, as adults, as children with situs inverses. So the, if you are seeing in a fetus that it's looking like a complete mirror image, there is no confusion. Then in those cases, in fact, that could be part of something called as a primary ciliary dyskinesia. And they are actually relatively good prognosis cases. Cardiac defects will be seen only in 5 to 10 percent and they will mostly the problems they will have will be related to infertility or recurrent sinusitis or sometimes recurrent bronchiectasis. But they don't have intellectual disability. They don't have other visceral abnormalities. These are the good cases, actually. So the pure situs inverses ones, but the other ones, all the other ones, of course, fall in the heterotaxy spectrum. So there we if the fetus is male, think of ZIC3. And uh, if it's not male or otherwise also, then there are so many other genes. And these genes actually all function. I, I don't want to go into details, of course. This will become too boring, I guess. But these genes all function right at the time of gastrulation. 
so at the time of gestation when the baby is you know still deciding which is its top which is its bottom what is left what's right that's the point when all these genes come into play and they actually decide something like uh, which side should become left and which should be right and it's the disturbance of these all things or these all pathways which cause all these problems in the situs so next slide we'll go to so um, so what test should we doing so what the case what uh, the doc, uh, doctor has asked so here we are having like a family where the baby has a situs abnormality and there is also a uh, the father and one more family member so grandfather i think so this is classical autosomal dominant inheritance one generation to next generation to next generation there is a situs abnormality and it need not always be the same type of abnormality that is the whole uh, kind of uh, i can say the beauty of this or whatever the complexity of this situs that uh, sometimes it can be heterotaxy sometimes it can be situs inversus also sometimes it can be just an isolated cardiac defect like a vsd for all just a vsd in the same family with the same mutation so there is so much of variability so and there are so many uh, so that's what the family she mentioned is autosomal dominant we can have autosomal recessive we can have excellent recessive which is mainly zik3 so all kinds of inheritance patterns are possible and overall 15 to 20% cases with a situs abnormality will have a single gene etiology means uh, that there would not be a chromosomal problem there will not be a micro deletion micro duplication there will be a problem at the level of an individual gene and uh, these are the cases because there are so many genes involved so you have to do something called as exome sequencing so the answer to the question is that the test to be done is exome sequencing because this is the test which is going to look for mutations in all the genes which can cause situs abnormality and then in uh, uh, that's how you are able to kind of uh, reach a diagnosis for that family and uh, then the uh, depending on that we can of course uh, predict a recurrence risk so um, so if for dominant you have 50% recurrence risk for recessive it's 25% for x linked if mother is a carrier it's again 50% for male babies so depending on the gene depending on inheritance pattern you can tell the family what is the chance of recurrence and it is in fact very important here in this site the cases of heterotaxy because many patients would actually go on to terminate these pregnancies so uh, they will not be interested to do anything because the baby has a poor prognosis but then doing genetic test helps them provide a proper counseling as to for the next time as to what is the recurrence risk we can offer them prenatal we can offer them pgt next time and also besides exome sequencing we should also offer microarray i would say in our indian settings exome sequencing is the first test we should do if there is a situs abnormality because in our own experience we are seeing that most of our indian babies are having autosomal recessive conditions most of the cases because we are so much endogamous we marry in the same caste the same gotra and all those and consanguinity especially in south part of india so for us microarray doesn't really work most of the times at least our experience has shown hardly any baby has any micro deletion micro duplications most babies have either a aneuploidy or a problem in the exome so here in heterotaxy we should directly go for exome the karyotype may will also mostly not yield anything and then encourage an autopsy again as dr aditya said so we really need to autopsy is going to give you so much more um, phenotypic information which we are not seeing on scan sometimes you may miss some small things so you do an autopsy you find that information collect proper samples so if the patient is willing do amniocentesis otherwise at birth collect either of these samples and then consult with a geneticist so that they can guide you for again subsequent testing and then of course as i said this is important implications Uh, for further pregnancies and one more important point like which um, uh, is there is that even antenatally suppose you are seeing some situs abnormality like one question was that there is an isolated dextrocardia so that's all you are seeing so uh, one thing is that we should be aware that there could be something else which you are not able to see right now so even in an isolated dextrocardia if you do exome sequencing and if you are able to find a particular mutation 
then depending on the gene involved we can get some idea of the prognosis so we can get some uh, understanding as to is this dextrocardia really isolated or could there be something else because we have some idea that this gene mutation causes this kind of problems in after birth of the baby so even antenatally especially the milder cases where you the patient may be thinking of continuing the pregnancy those are the cases where you should in fact antenatally also of do genetic testing so i think uh, you know from my so, side this these are the things we we always you know for all cases uh, genetic testing has to be done that's what would be the wonderful wonderful genetic. points dr shagun because that is a myth that you know we don't need to do genetic testing in heterotaxy yes. so yes. as you very clearly brought out an exome is important it could be genetic and at least if you do a, a micro array you might get so if the karyotype not being important was because karyotype related problems may not be there but yes. they may be less than that so we've saved the best for the last and uh, i'm going to ask dr adi to give a little summary on you know heterotaxy so that all the 163 people who are still logged in go home with some really golden take home messages um right uh, many many of them have heard my lecture i, I think uh, so i just uh, how, how much time do i have till we all log I, I out like to give him unlimited time this man is so good with heterotaxies he puts everything yeah. we can remember it correctly for the next 3 months <laughs> I I didn't I couldn't hear most of it. Sorry. I said you're so good at heterotaxies. We want to carry home that message for the next three months. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, very nice. Thanks, bro. Uh, thanks, uh, big boss. Um, I know uh, heterotaxy. If you ask anyone, uh, that's the uh, last uh, chapter they want to read, tend to read, and most often they don't read. they open the first page of heterotaxy and it all goes for a toss uh, that is same with me i was thinking how the hell i can make a diagnosis of heterotaxy i'm, I'm just a poor obstetrician um, so it irritated me so i thought there must be some easy way to make a diagnosis uh, but if there is a easy way then there is uh, bound to have some false positive false negative so i said my current diagnosis uh, detection rate of our attribution att attributing a correct heterotaxy is around 0% so if i get to 10% 20% 90% i am very happy so i retrospectively gone through all my cases and i was uh, going through the heart ache how do i make a diagnosis so finally i uh, decided there should be easy method so that's what uh, if you if you want me to present uh, i'll present few slides shall i yes please okay good uh, shall i share my screen I, i'll skip most of it all of you know uh, but only one point i want to make here is you cannot look at any of the internal thoracic or abdominal structures to make a diagnosis of uh, laterality uh, you can't see the three lobe lung epiarterial hyperarterial these are all easy for aditya uh, is uh, can you see polysplenia yes polysplenia asplenia good so you could see splenia uh, yeah, polysplenia asplenia by a uh, little bit more attention and if you see normal spleen in a normal fetus then you get tend to identify the structure a little bit easier you can use color to see the splenic artery uh, but uh, whether it is asplenia or polysplenia both are non functional so it will clinically do not make any difference you diagnose splenia asplenia and sometimes you don't know it is not easy to they will not be in the same position as uh, normal behind the stomach at that time it very difficult because the bubble also have a similar echogenicity so practically there is no need and uh, it is not required and it is not easy to look at the spleen and make a diagnosis so forget Thank about you. it uh, none of them will help so what would help is your vascular connections and it is quite easier the ivc is on the right side and the pulmonary veins are on the left side so looking at these two we should be able to make a diagnosis of heterotaxy 
in about 90 percent so that's what i wanted to uh, emphasize one second i will so uh, some of the things are already discussed i'll just flip through so if, if there is a arrangement normal arrangement we call it a situs solitus and uh, if it is a complete mirror image we call it as situs inverses and if there's anything in between we call it as heterotaxy so that's probably the simplest way of understanding heterotaxy and in ultrasound i said we can't see any of the structures to make a diagnosis for certain and i want to make one point about uh, uh, atrial appendages atrial appendages are uh, diagnosis under pathologist uh, if we ultrasoundologist or a fetal medicine specialist even the pediatric cardiologist will find it difficult to identify the appendages appropriately and if you ask me i can convince anybody to say this is left and this is right so it is very difficult to make a diagnosis looking at the atrial appendages one point if you want to see the right atrial appendage the hammock view will help you and if you start seeing the appendage morphology in normal cases sometimes you may identify in a heterotaxy but by and by and large looking at the atrial appendages is practically of no use so all all what we left with is only the vessels so looking at the vessels how can we make i'll take you through so in a left heterotaxy the baby does not know what is the right side structure so what it does it doubles the left side structures that's why it's called left heterotaxy the opposite is the right heterotaxy so I'll, I'll flip through i'll show you the cases and then i'll, like, I'll tell you how to, how to diagnose okay so now this is a, a, a four or five uh, simple cases i can see this is 13 weaker the stomach is on one side the apex is on the other side so is it a site is ambiguous of course your site is ambiguous so then once the site is ambiguous your antenna should go up and see if there any cardiac abnormality and also look at the vessels so here this heart is beating at a lower speed if you have a bradycardia less than 16 weeks is almost invariably it's a heterotaxy and almost invariably it is left heterotaxy because your conducting system belongs to right side this fetus does not know what is right so what it does it does, it makes the left side structure both on the left side and the right side so your conducting system will go haywire so that's why you get bradycardias or bradyarrhythmias in a left atrial isomerism or left heterotaxy so you may have cardiac abnormalities not necessarily need to have cardiac abnormality but many of them will associate with cardiac abnormality this is a uh, absd to all those things so the diagnosis was situs ambiguous and a heart block so immediate diagnosis would be your left heterotaxy because this baby does has not understood what is right so it has done two left sided structures stomach on one side apex on the other side stomach is on the left side heart is on the right side so now in this case you can see there are two appendages appear similar this is a normal one this is a left sided this is a right sided so looking at the atrial appendages and start making a diagnosis it will be difficult so i don't want you to go through go looking at the atrial appendages now we come to vessels what are the two vessels ivc and pulmonary veins here if you can see the red one is a ivc Red one is IVC. Uh, soon after the kidney, it disappears and the azygous continuation will be there. So you have two vessels next to each other, iota and azygous vein. So why there is azygous vein? Because IVC is interrupted. IVC belongs to right side. So this baby has not understood what is right side. It has developed doubled the, the left side structure. So what is the diagnosis? Left heterotaxy. So by just looking at double barrel, where did we see? Behind the heart, behind the four chamber. Two vessels, double barrel, it's left heterotaxy unless proven otherwise. This one, there's referred for abnormal ductus venosis. Uh, 
Is there a site is ambiguous? Originally, I thought it was a site is ambiguous, but cardiac apex and the stomach on both are on, on, one, on the same side and belong to left side. So do you need to have a site as ambiguity in making a diagnosis of uh, heterotaxy? Not necessarily. In left atrial isomerism, as uh, uh, Sudha told, out, out of the three, two are sufficient. So you don't need to have a site as ambiguity. So you have a cardiac abnormality, ABSD, in the same fetus. And the baby had bready arrhythmias. So again, the conducting system belongs to right side. Right side system is not working. Left side structures have become doubled. So what is the diagnosis? Left heterotaxy. Okay. So this one, uh, again, the stomach on one side, apex is on the other side. There is a cardiac abnormality. So iota and uh, IVC are on the same side. So they juxtaposed. So juxtapose IVC you will see in right isomerism. So I don't want to make a diagnosis there. Come back to your area behind the heart. So look at the area behind the heart is very busy. I have reduced the PRF. That's why it's a little bit bleeding. Uh, if it is very busy vascular in terms of vascularity, then you should suspect TAPVC. So these pulmonary veins are not entering to the left atrium. So pulmonary veins belongs to left side. So this baby has not understood what is the left side. So pulmonary veins will not go into the left atrium. They form a anomalous connection. So that means baby has not understood left side. So it has to be right heterotaxy. The last one, or maybe I'll skip this one. Easy, easy. Now, the last one. This is a BMI of uh, my BMI, maybe a little bit more than my BMI. Hardly you could see the heart, but in less than uh, two and a half seconds, you could make a diagnosis. Stomach on one side, heart on the other side, and what did you see? Double barrel. So this is, one of them is a azagas vein. Azagas seen, that means IVC is interrupted. That means baby has not understood the right side. So it has to be left heterotaxy. Okay. So we've made uh, you know, 25 cases of uh, situs. Okay. I'll just give you a last summary slide. First, what you should do clinically when you assess any fetus, look at the situs. How do you assess the situs? You, you adapt whatever technique you want to. Uh, as long as you make a proper diagnosis, it's fine. So stomach and heart, if both are on same side, and if it happens to be on the left side, then it is situs solitus. If stomach and heart happens to be on the same side, but it is on the right side, then it is situs inversus. If stomach and heart on the opposite side, then it is heterotaxy. And the next question comes, how do you know which is right, which is a uh, right heterotaxy or left heterotaxy? Where do you look? You look area behind the heart. If you see double vessel in area behind the heart, that means azagas when is seen, IVC is interrupted, baby has not understood right side, it is a left heterotaxy. And if you see a TAPVC, that means left side structures are not working, baby has not understood the left side, so it has done two sided, two right sided structures, that's a right heterotaxy. So this is <laughs> the simplest formula I could uh, ever thought think about. Uh, wherever I present, I, I really get a lot of uh, applauses. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I personally, very happy, got something to make it simple. I'm simple obstetrician. I don't want to complicate issue. People say, can you diagnose this 100%? No, I will never able to get 100% diagnosis. And you don't need to do 100% diagnosis because the management by and large depends upon what abnormality you, you see. Okay. After uh, first, uh, Ashok sir gave me a chance to speak in Delhi. Uh, 
second time when I presented, I forgot the name of a guy, he's from Hyderabad only. Uh, after two or three drinks, he said, what a wonderful lecture you gave. You made heterotaxis very simple. I have a little bit suggestion. What is it? After two rounds of alcohol, he said, double, double vessel is left heterotaxi, baki sub right heterotaxi. He made even more simpler than that. If it works, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adi. And uh, you would have got a great round of applause if we had not muted everybody. I'm sure everyone is clapping there or they're busy clicking a picture of that slide because it's just, you know, heterotaxi 101. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, see, we knew the right place for the person who understands everything out of place, isn't it? No, I've not understood. Uh, don't mistake me. I've not understood because I did not understand. I got this one. If I understood, probably I would have made it even more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't understand what you said. <laughs> so the point is, thank you very much. You really simplified the uh, thing. And see, that's what, no? if you can't explain <laughs> it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So yeah. <laughs> the best explanations are the simplest ones. Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Adi. Thank there you. was one question, I think still uh, what Projecta was asking, we misunderstood that time. She said that she had a case where she had left asumerism, but she also had SVT. Is that possible? She wanted an explanation. So any of the experts? No, I think uh, it's basically a conduction with SVT. I don't know how it can uh, trigger off. So probably that case would need a little more detail yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, something it, to it, be understood. It may be coincidental, uh, but coincidence uh, is not always. If you have to explain the conducting system disorders based on the heterotaxy, that's because atria and ventricle may have disordered connections. So you would have conduction blocks rather than supraventricular tachycardia because of reentrant uh, mechanism. So I don't think that SVT is actually a heterotaxy phenomena. So I think the first lesson which you gave in the beginning of the session that instead of labeling it as heterotaxy, you could have a descriptive diagnosis of whatever you found there. And maybe you would have found some rare phenomenon that would actually open a door to a new diagnosis. So I think, uh, I mean, I am personally very enriched with this session because heterotaxy has always been a challenge and the way it has been simplified by all our experts and particularly Dr. Adi uh, and, uh, you know, Dr. Aditya for the pathology and Dr. Shagun for the genetics and uh, Dr. Kurana, Dr. Praveen and Dr. Geeta for all the clinical inputs. I think it's wonderful. So uh, any uh, final words from our experts, then we'll hand it over to Dr. Shagun for the vote of thanks. I just want to congratulate uh, Aditya. What a wonderful images. Uh, life is easier if you see, if you open and see. Unfortunately, we are not that fortunate. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, but I should say that most of those cases were not mine. Uh, I have had the good fortune. You, should, you shouldn't say, stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> coming ready okay. to where it's due. Okay, Praveen sir. Yeah, congratulations, Chirmay. It's, it's a wonderful session. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, simple, simplified uh, aspects we have learned, and it's good because it becomes easy for us to practice in our day to day yeah. uh, uh, evaluations. Geeta, ma'am. Uh, it was a good session. Excellent. Uh, I think simple points. I would actually start from live presentation, looking at abdominal situs. I think while we speak so much on this, I always go by the iota inferior vena cava. Iota to the left, inferior vena cava to the right, and inferior to the iota. I think that gives you all the clue. Then you go and examine the heart. For me, that is always a good image when you're taking an AC. I would um, really insist on that plain very, very much. And then you go to the heart and then you get all the clues, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Kurana, sir. I think yes. Uh, okay. we are so uh, Aditi, over to you. I would like to invite Dr. Shagun now for a vote of thanks for tonight's session. Thank you, Aditi. So um, 
like after this wonderful session, I mean, uh, it's really kind of my pleasure and privilege to offer the vote of thanks. And uh, this has been our second monthly meeting of the Telangana chapter of SFM. And like, we are really grateful to Dr. Kurana and uh, Dr. Praveen and Dr. Geeta and all our mentors, all our seniors for uh, providing us this opportunity. And uh, uh, as always, we have had a really invigorating program today. And uh, I would like to first thank Dr. Chinmay uh, because she has really compiled this wonderful series today. And uh, she's been very proactive and has been uh, kind of uh, prodding everybody to present, present, present. So uh, really thanks to her for organizing this. And then I would like to, of course, thank our senior experts, uh, Dr. Adi Narayana. I mean, it was wonderful having you and uh, all your uh, experience on heterotaxy. It's been really great. And Dr. Geeta, of course, uh, and um, then we have had a wonderful discussion in the first session. Then I would like to thank the presenters, Dr. Madhvilata, Dr. Sudha, Dr. Anuradha, and of course, Dr. Aditya, and uh, who have shared their cases. And uh, Dr. Aditya especially has shared the pathology perspective, which has kind of given us another viewpoint into the fetal situs. And uh, finally, for the second session, I extend my thanks to Dr. Ashok Kurana and Dr. Thiel and Praveen, who are, of course, the torch bearers for SFM, and they have actually always spearheaded the literally intense academics that is synonymous with our association. So it has really been a privilege to have them amongst us, as always. And uh, finally, I would like to thank the audience, still 160 plus people who are still tuned in and uh, for their questions, for their active participation. And then the final thanks would be to the tech support, to Vishal, and of course, last but not least, the trade partners for their contribution and always. So I think with this, uh, we can probably conclude this session. Thank you, Dr. Aditi, for uh, coordinating uh, this. I know. Indeed. Thank you, Dr. Aditi, <laughs> <laughs> who's been yes. calling all of us off and on. But really, it was wonderful. This is a really nice session. And uh, I think I hope all of them uh, liked it. Our next program will be on the 18th of May. And I really request anyone who wants to present their cases to contact Dr. Shagun or myself. And we'll be happy to take it forward. Thank you very much. Wish you all a very good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.